Today I will be reading from the New International Version, Jeremiah 22, verse 3. And it says, This is what the Lord says, Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do not wrong, do, do not wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. by uh, our brothers and sisters on live stream via YouTube, as well as through Faith FM uh, station 87.6. I welcome them in a special way. Thank you, Sister Suzanne, for the children's story. It's always captivating. It's a highlight of my day, certainly, at church. Thank you, Elder for the welcome. Thank you for acknowledging uh, B uh, back there. I don't think I, I do enough of that. So thank you so much for doing that on my behalf. She does look after us. There's four kids. <laughs> There's four kids. I think I'm the toughest one to look after. Thank you so much B for all you do for the family. Just want to take a moment to remember the sick ones of our number who are, who are not with us here. Uh, it's, it's a tough time when families are going through uh, illnesses. It, it, it's tough. Sometimes you ask uh, where God is. You know, where, where are you, God? Through all this uh, difficult time. So Sebastian, I believe, is uh, being considered for surgery next, uh, this coming week. He's gone through such a, a tough time, and so has the family. Uh, we ask that you will remember him in your prayers. It's not only him, there's many others that are going through a difficult time. I've entitled, I, I was aiming to, to get you out of here uh, by 12. I still, I think I, I, I'm aiming for that. Um, so I just want us to remind each other of a, a few truths which I, I, I came across as I was preparing uh, today's uh, sermon. And I've entitled it, My Brother's Keeper. Are we familiar with that term? My Brother's Keeper. It was, I believe, Friday. It was on a day in, on Friday, the 19th of November. So a couple of weeks ago, when Dr. Sikulile Moyo of the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute was just going through some of the results of the genomic sequencing that they were doing on a, a coronavirus. They do that routinely. They get samples, of, of, of samples from patients and from clinics, and they sequence the type of virus that is you know, before them and try and decide what type of strain it is, what variant it is. Dr. Sikulile Moyo, a Zimbabwean working as the director of this uh, uh, institute, was stunned as the results were, were, were scrolling down his computer screen because he noticed that this particular strain they had not come across before. It had over 50 mutations. 50 mutations of the spike protein that covers the, 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 the coronavirus. 50 mutations. So he calls a, a friend, a colleague, and says, look at this. Am I seeing things here? We haven't seen this before. This must be a new strain. He says. And of course, his friend concurs, and they quickly upload the, the, uh, the data 
uh, in a sort of PA forum, a PA uh, database, just to make the world aware that they had come across a new strain of the uh, COVID. Soon after that, a team in, in Gauteng, South Africa, and another team in Hong Kong confirmed the same strain. It is the strain, of course, that uh, the WHO was to call the B11529 strain, or the Omicron. And they quickly termed it a, a variant of concern. And of course, as soon as that news came out, you know, starting with the UK, quickly followed by Australia, US and the EU, the world scrambled to shut this virus out of uh, its shores. In most cases, of course, these countries were soon to discover that the virus had already, was already circulating within their borders. And as I was observing the frantic response to this latest variant, I started thinking about the realities of, of vaccine inequity that we see around the world. Some countries have vaccination rates of about 99% double vaccinated. Gibraltar is one, and the small enclave of uh, ACT here is nearly there in our own Australia. This compares with some other countries, the poor ones, where vaccination rates are less than 2%. Less than 2%. I just had my third uh, dose yesterday, and thinking about it, fellow human beings around the world are scrambling to have their first doses. Worse still, as I looked into this issue, I, dis I discovered the disparity that is there in the cost it takes a poor country to buy a single dose of a vaccine. I think Botswana pays about $29 per dose, 29 US dollars per dose of the Moderna uh, vaccine. This compares to around $5 in the European Union. So the countries with money that can afford the doses buy it cheaply. The countries where, you know, there's no money, the, 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 the populations are struggling with the, with the basics, and they've got to sort of work hard to, to, to prioritize what, 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 what they can use their money for. They are charged the, the, the greatest amount. Of course, this is not new. We saw this during the AIDS uh, uh, pandemic in the early days. You know, where the, the virus was ravaging, and it was ravaging not because of, of behavior or anything like that, it was ravaging because people had no access to treatment. And it had long been discovered that the triple therapy uh, was very effective. It was so expensive, it's expensive for the, for the needy countries, very cheap for the uh, 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 rich countries. I was reminded of what Dr. Ted Ross, who is the Director General of the WHO said. He said, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And that is true for this pandemic and for many other situations. No one is safe until everyone is safe. What good is, what good is it to have a hundred percent coverage of, of, of uh, vaccination in the developed world and have two, one percent in the poorer countries. So who will stand for these impoverished, uh, impoverished uh, souls of the world? Am I my brother's keeper? That's the question. Am I my brother's keeper? And of course, when God asked Cain after he had uh, slew uh, uh, Abel, you know, asking where Abel was, Cain's response was, am I my brother's keeper? 
we don't know what God immediate response uh, to that question was. But if I were to summarize that, that question, am I my brother's keeper? I'm sure God would have said, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes? We are our brother's keepers. When we see a neighbor suffering, a friend suffering, a, a loved one suffering, a stranger suffering, it must cause us to, uh, to suffer as well. Because we are our brother's keeper. The scriptures do testify to that fact all across the Bible. And thank you, Sean, for, for reading Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3 uh, uh, for us. It says, thus says the Lord, in the New King James Version, thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the, land, of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. And when God says in Proverbs 31 verses 8 and 9, when he says, open your mouth for the speechless, in the cause of all who are appointed to die, open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. How many of us can say we have stood up for the rights of others? Are we prepared to go against the grain and stand up for those who need the voice, our voice and action? We are reminded in an amazing example of, of, of advocacy. When Jonathan, uh, being brave and talking to his father, when this, the king had gone mad, had lost all reason and thought, and was after this hero of Israel, David, who had, in fact, who was responsible for the king being on the throne. Because had Goliath triumphed, the agreement was that the Philistines were going to take over uh, Israel. So David has done this wonderful act through the hand of God, and yet Saul is after him, is jealous, is raging. He wants to kill him. Listen to what uh, Jonathan says, being his brother's keeper. He says in 1 Samuel 19, verses 4 and 5, Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. And said to him, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David? without a cause. Here is Jonathan being his brother's keeper. Brothers and sisters, having loved God with all our being, what does Christ say we should do? Love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The second, and, the second of the, of the uh, uh, great commandments that we should uh, live by. God is first, of course. We love God with all our heart, with all our being, with all our strength. The second commandment is like it as well, Christ said. It is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And what does this look like in our day-to-day -day life? I think it means putting the welfare of others at the forefront of our day-to-day -day endeavors. It means a, fair, a firm no, a firm no to little huddles, because I see it at work, to little huddles in a corner to scandalize in the name of a, a workmate. Just grab each other. Did you see what he did? He's awful, isn't he? 
Oh, she's nasty. Did you see what she's wearing today? What do we do when we come across such situations? Do we stand for the scandalized? Are we our brother's keeper? Are we our sister's a keeper? You know, Abraham gives us a bit of an example of how to think of others before we think of ourselves. We will remember him and his nephew, Lot, his big family that, that came out of uh, Ur to go to a place they didn't know. And of course, they had a lot of livestock and there was tension between the, the headsmen you know, about you know, which, which livestock was going to get the best uh, uh, pasture and so on. And Abraham, being a, a wise old head, says, look, this is not working. There's strain and strife uh, between our families. Why don't we separate? If you take east, I'll take west. If you take north, I'll take south. Uh, but it's up to you. You choose first. So he deferred the choice to his younger relative. Is that not wonderful? That simple act to say others come first. Others come first. He gave us a wonderful example there. And how many Adventists in good and regular standing walked by the other side as they saw the victim of, of thuggery until the good Samaritan came by. There was a Levite, there was a priest, there was an elder, Ragada went by. <laughs> the elder went by. I'm sorry, elder. The elder went by and said, ah, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to mess up my suit or whatever. And went on his way. Pastor Kenji came, the priest, had a look and said, nah, not today. Sorry, Pastor. Until the good Samaritan came and did all that he did. We know the story. We know the story. We have a duty. We have a duty to be our brother's keeper. And talking to the kids now, kids... When you are in your school buses, I know what goes on. I, I was a kid once, 50 odd years ago, 54 today, thank God for that. In the bus, we can get bullying, right? In buses, in school buses, there's bullying, and kids can be nasty. You know, the devil does work even through kids. Kids can be nasty and, uh, and so on. What do we teach our children? How, how, what do we teach our children to do in those situations? Do we even take time to teach them on ways to respond when they come across such situations? I know we are so exercised uh, these days about safety, and that's important. We don't want our children to get into trouble. We don't want our children to, uh, to be hurt. But what principles do we teach them? How should they respond in such situations? How can they safely stand for the rights of others at that early age? When we see cyberbullying and we participate in, I'm talking to youngsters, to our youth now, do we participate at all in cyberbullying, in calling people names, in laughing at the appearance of, a, of an individual? Oh, look at her. If I wasn't here, I, was, I, I wouldn't wear that type of a dress. It doesn't suit her. And what about us, the body of, 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 of Christ? You know, I determined uh, not to perhaps raise this issue, but I think I should. while talking about being our brother's keepers, keeper. In some parts of the world, 
there's such a sca uh, scarcity of, uh, of pastors that one pastor will, will manage up to 10 congregations. Can you imagine that? Up to 10 congregations. Unfortunately, I've seen it right here on our shores in Australia. Yes? Those churches whose tithes don't quite hit a certain mark will get a part, a whole time equivalent of a pastor. Maybe 0.6, uh, 0 .6 uh, whole time equivalent. In other words, six tenths of a full-time pastor based on the amount of uh, tithe that gets into your coffers. Other churches who are more blessed will have two pastors. Two pastors. This is in Australia. This is in WA. In WA. Who stands up for the week? What of a church that has elderly folk in, in the majority who are not working anymore, whose tithe doesn't come up to a certain goal. Who stands up for those churches? Don't they need spiritual guidance themselves? Don't they need spiritual uh, leadership? There'll be a pastor sitting uh, on the pews because their deputy is preaching today, yet... There's no pastor for another church. There's no guidance in another church. This is in WA. That's one uh, to ponder. And I make an appeal to, to the powers that be to think that one through. To say, what are we teaching the world? What are we teaching the world about being our brother's keeper. Have we sunk so low? Have we sunk so low that everything has a bottom line, a cash bottom line? And so, yes, we are our brother's keeper. We look out for each other. We should look out for each other. We should stand for the right cause. We do good when we stand up to fight the battle of the downtrodden. In Welfare Ministry, pages 15 and 16, it's, uh, it's 12 now, so I had promised to, to stop. I'll stop. Pages 16, uh, 15 and 16, Sister White says, there never was a time when there was greater need for the exercise of mercy than today. The poor are all around us, the distressed, the afflicted, the sorrowing, and those who are ready to perish. The Lord has made ample provision for all. He has given to thousands of men large supplies with which to alleviate the want of their fellows. But those whom God has made stewards have not stood the test, for they have failed to relieve the suffering and the needy. Brethren, we all have a part to play in meeting the needs of the least of these. The least of these. How do you personally express your appreciation of what God has done for you in Christ? One church member put it this way. On the street one day, I saw a small girl, cold and shivering in a thin dress. With little hope of a decent meal, I became angry and said to God, Why did you permit this? Why don't you do something about it? For a while, God said nothing. Then that night, he replied quite suddenly, I certainly did something about it. I made you. God created each one of us for his service. Each one of us to be our brother's keeper. When we see injustice, be it in our local church, be it higher up, be it at home, we 
just cannot keep quiet. We should not keep quiet. And what factors did Jesus use to separate the sheep? Or what factors would Jesus use to separate the sheep and the goats in the parable as depicted in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46? Perhaps we should read that one. Matthew chapter 25, just as I draw to a close, verses 31 to 46. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will, sit, uh, he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. When the king, then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came into me. You kept the Sabbath holy. Does it say that? No. You returned a faithful tithe. Does it say that? No. What criteria does he use here to separate the, the, the goats from the sheep? It is the day-to-day -day, uh, activities, the day-to-day -day care we give to, to others. That is what he's, he used to separate the sheep from the goats. So Jesus shows us that preaching the gospel also means tangible expressions of love and compassion for the least of these, the hungry, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and imprisoned. Preaching the good news, the gospel, must be accomplished with good deeds. May God add a blessing to this little uh, chat that we've had this afternoon. Let us remember that we are our brother's keepers. We are our brother's keepers. We can't keep quiet, we can't keep silent, we can't look the other way. We are our brother's keepers. Amen.